In a battle between a hot new electric vehicle company and hot new inflation numbers, I'm afraid that inflation wins. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on, you guessed it, inflation. It turns out that Larry may just have been right. It's always important to avoid excessive certainty. Sarah Ketterer of Causeway Capital on that big announcement that three giants, GE, Johnson & Johnson, and Toshiba, would all break themselves up. And famed investor Jeremy Grantham on just how overheated he thinks this market has gotten. We've never seen anything like this. We started the week pretty sure of where we were going. Earnings were up, at least basically. Equities were reaching up to new highs. Bonds were tame. And we had a new infrastructure package. All was right with the world. But then Wednesday hit, and consumer inflation numbers came in high, higher than anyone really expected. An annualized increase of 6.2%. That's the highest in nearly 30 years. Austin Goolsbee of the Chicago Booth School said it's not going away anytime soon. Look, it's a big number, and uh, whether you're team permanent or team temporary, everybody agrees it's it's going to be months of this uh, be before you see any relief. And San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly, while saying it was too soon to change course, admitted that the inflation numbers really did get her attention. Inflation is high, higher. It's eye-popping. This is a transitory period. That's what we believe, that's what I think when I look out at the data, but it's directly related to COVID. And as quicker we get through COVID, the better off we're going to be as an economy. But the week wasn't over yet, as electric vehicle maker Rivian went to market and blew past the price set for the IPO. The results of what the Rivian CEO said was a true team effort. We spent years and years putting this together, and really what's so exciting is seeing such a diverse group of people with diverse backgrounds and and interests really coming together uh, to create these products and, and you know, standing there today looking out at the team as, as we rang the bell, uh, it was quite emotional, you know, seeing, seeing so many passionate faces. It was, it was really powerful. And three corporate giants, GE, Johnson & Johnson, and Toshiba, all decided to break themselves up, with GE CEO Larry Culp saying it was all about focus. These businesses will be more focused. There'll be a higher, greater level of accountability. We should have sharper capital allocation, more strategic flexibility. And frankly, I think it's going to be good for the team as well. I think we'll end up with investor bases focused on these pure plays, investors that are probably underinvested in GE today. You put all that together, it's clear this is the best path for us to unlock and create value going forward. And when the dust settled from what is fairly called a wild week, it left equities down for the first time since early October, though not as much because of a Friday rally, with the S&P 500 off about three-tenths of a percent and the Nasdaq down seven-tenths. But really much of the action was over on the bond side, with the 10-year yield up to well over 1.5 percent and inflation concerns driving the 10-year tips up to over 2.7 percent. To take us through the week and what it taught us, we welcome now Greg Peters, co-CIO of PGM Fixed Income, and Sarah Ketterer, CEO of Causeway Capital Management. So let's start on the equity side. Uh, welcome, Sarah. Give us a sense of the equities, because we started the, the week really at record levels, and then the inflation numbers hit, but then they came back up at the end of the week. Mm, yes, they did. The in inflation genie seems to be out of the bottle and markets have to digest that. The technology stocks, many of them seem to have such significant market shares or competitive positioning. The market is giving them credit for being able to price this inflation, pass it on to consumers. But there are many in, in both industries and sectors, according to our team, where that won't necessarily be the case. And that's really the job of the fundamental research analyst is to determine whether or not a business, say it's consumer staples and uh, food beverage, can they pass on their co increased cost of raw materials on into their final product? Because if they can't, that means margin squeeze and that means earnings will, all other things being equal, will decline, which is not good for markets. So, Greg, when we see inflation numbers like this, we automatically think about what it does to bonds and perhaps most important, what it says to the Fed and how they might react. What did you make of this week? 
Yeah, I think that's the story. What it makes, uh, what it tells you about the Fed and central bank action ultimately. And so there's been this this uh, response in the bond market really before the CPI print that uh, inflation is p- picking up, and more importantly, that the Fed is going to be much more aggressive and central banks globally much more aggressive than initially anticipated. So I think that is the story in the marketplace, the two-year yield. Uh, And then equally, I I mean, this is a volatile market in fixed income that has been largely isolated in fixed income. So what you're seeing is this disconnect in volatility in fixed income and equities. And yes, it does make some sense for sure as the as the earnings coming out are quite strong, margins all time high, the uh, the micro story is is quite supportive. But at some point the volatility that we're seeing in fixed income markets have to start to infiltrate other markets and risk markets um, if it doesn't settle down. But Craig, at the same time, how much is the Fed sort of putting a blanket on that volatility, even given what we've seen? Because certainly they've made it pretty clear they're not in a rush to change course. You just heard Mary Daly say, well, we're not going to change course right away. Yeah, but they've changed their rhetoric uh, quite substantially since the summer. And if you look at the bond market yield into two year uh, and even inflation, uh, it's it's been commensurate with the change in Fed tone. So I don't know. I, I, uh, I'm really worrying about the Fed here moving too fast too soon, particularly when you think about the construct of inflation, that it's largely outside of the Fed control. So the Fed raising rates isn't going to help offset the supply chain issues, right? It's not going to have those kind of effects like it normally does. That's a really important point. Uh, No matter what the interest rates are, it's not going to help the supply chain right now. Sarah, what about over on the equity side? If you're looking at equities, are you more concerned about what the Fed might do in terms of interest rates? Are you more concerned with what you were talking about, which is really pressure on margins just because prices are going so high? We're concerned about both. Our team at Causeway are looking at both what could affect earnings and and also to what degree if the Fed does react prematurely, is that going to be a depressant on markets overall? We just think about market sensitivity or beta and which stocks have it and which don't and how to be positioned in this kind of environment. But the cry we hear from companies, and we interview hundreds of companies, is that they don't have the labor they need. There seems to be this chronic labor shortage, which is something we haven't seen. Normally we talk about slack and, and that doesn't appear to be the case. And it's not like the labor isn't there somewhere. It doesn't seem to want to work in many of these jobs. Uh, and that ultimately may lead to a solution in automation or types of, um, of labor replacement. But in the interim, that means that the wage has to rise in order to attract the labor that's needed to make, for example, packaging. And and how high does it have to go? And then once it's there, is it intractable or likely? I mean, people don't very easily accept wage cuts. They only want increases. And if it ratchets upward, that, in our view, is a wage price spiral. And the Fed should react. Yeah, that is the concern, that wages tend to be stickier than other sorts of prices, no question about it. At the same time, if in the short to medium term they have to raise wages, it puts pressure on margins. Sarah, uh, how do you differentiate who can raise their prices and who can't? You talked earlier about pricing power. Is that by categories or is that company by company, depending on their brands? It's both. But uh, thinking about, let's let's stay within technology because it's been such a hot area of all markets. Uh, looking where there are few competitors, an area that we like now are semiconductors, particularly memory, and they're really only three. Micron, Samsung, and Hynix, the latter two are in South Korea. They have such significant scale advantages over all their competitors that they can. There's happened to be a shortage of their product, but to the degree they have price pressures themselves, they should be able to pass those on because there are no alternatives. And where there aren't alternatives, there is uh, some flexibility, but that only goes so far. There's something called the substitution effect that happens when prices rise for, and maybe not for the essential semiconductor, but other, other goods that are used in manufacturing, there may be substitution, which could be quite damaging. So really the question is how long will this go on 
because that's the determinant of what the outcome is for companies. So Greg, Sarah says on the equity side, maybe some areas like semiconductors on the tech side might be good investments. What about on the bond side? You're investing bonds right now. How do you invest? It sounds like you fear the policy error of moving too fast in terms of raising rates rather than too slowly. So what does that say to you as a bond investor? Yeah, so I what I think one of the worst areas to invest in the bond market right now uh, is in, in the inflation market. Uh, I think what's being priced in uh, uh, in inflation and tips is, is just too much, to be brutally frank. So uh, that is one area that I would not uh, look to invest. Uh, we still see value in U.S. Treasuries, actually. I, I, I know it's crazy to say, but uh, but we think the long-term interest rate from where we are today is lower, not higher. And there's a multitude of reasons for that, uh, in part because there's too much debt in the world uh, uh, and the inflation story uh, and, and growth story gets pulled down by that uh, tremendous amount of debt. But within credit, we still see value. So uh, I still see value uh, in the high yield market. It's clearly not what it used to be, that's for sure. But I still think that you're in this environment with strong M&A, strong earnings, uh, that really benefits the uh, high yield uh, bond market. So uh, those are just some ideas, but we still see value in fixed income and we still see value in credit. So give us a sense of duration, whether it is uh, uh, treasuries or whether it is credit. Uh, where do you see the greater opportunities, particularly given your concerns about volatility in the bond market? Yeah, so I, I mean, we always bifurcate the risk, the, the duration and the spread risk uh, separately. But, uh, but we're not scared of duration, right? I, what I think the back end of the curve uh, in treasuries uh, has some real value. And then quite frankly, the front end in credit has a tremendous amount of value. It's, uh, it's risk remote. Uh, we think it uh, has really positive attributes. So we see kind of value across the curve, but our bottom line message at PGM Fixed Income is we do not fear duration for sure. We think it's uh, an important part of any asset allocation decision. Okay, thank you so very much for being with us. That's Greg Peters. He is CIO, co-CIO of PGM. Sarah Ketter of Causeway Capital is going to be sticking with us as we turn our attention to all those big corporate breakups this week. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It was a week of breaking up, at least when it came to some very big corporations like Toshiba and Johnson & Johnson and General Electric. And GE Chairman and CEO Larry Culp said in the end it was a clear choice of focus over synergy. The GE teams heard from me for the last three years that I will bet on the benefits of focus every day, far more than the often illusory benefits that come from synergies. Now, we certainly enjoy those synergies today in certain places, but more and more, we've been running the company on a decentralized basis, not as one GE, not as even the four reporting segments, but the 30 P&Ls that deal with customers that compete in the markets every single day. So if there are synergies that we enjoy today, we'll work to continue those, of course, but the vast majority of the benefits here will come from focus. Sarah Ketter of Causeway Capital Management is still with us. So, Sarah, I, I want to talk to you as an investor because you own GE. We talked to Larry Culp and he said part of the benefit is for investors so they can focus as well on which line they'd like to be invested in. As you look at this breaking up of GE, how do you analyze it? The, well, I just want to set the stage that we may be one of the few who are analyzing it. GE is absolutely hated by investors because of the damage they've done. If you think about it, David, to to today, if you go back to so the last five years, the annualized performance of the S&P 500 has been 20%. So that's 20% per annum on average. The comparable number for GE is negative 13%. <laughs> GE is a disaster. So Larry Culp's arrival in October of 2018, he had his work cut out for him and he's very incentivized financially to get it done. But there, there, the two great businesses there were aviation and healthcare and then power renewables and digital weren't quite as good. And uh, the key was to set them free. There were some codependency because not only did power and renewables have some serious problems, but then we had COVID. So then what happens to the aviation business? You know, this is 
um, aircraft engines, avionics systems, it, it grinds to a halt. So free cash flow collapses and therefore the healthcare business had to support the other two. So what makes this announcement so interesting is that it may be signaling that GE is getting beyond its problems. It'll actually coming back into blue skies where the long-term care business that the company has that is supposed to pay people for nursing care and um, end of life assistance, that was a, uh, they, GE stopped writing those policies in 2006, but it's been a huge financial burden for the company. Under-reserving has been a chronic problem. So this breakup, as it may, as Larry Colt noted in the video, allow these three areas to shine on their own. It, it may be signaling, according to our industrial analysts, that GE is not worried any longer about long-term care. because, And that means we shouldn't, as investors, be worried, and that is a very good thing. Yeah, it sure is, given the history there. But let's take those three lines of business, because they're not breaking it all up at once. I thought that that was important. I mean, the first they spin off healthcare, which you said, that's the strongest one anyway. That's ready to go on its own. They're going to take another year on power to sort of get that up and running. It may need a little more help. And then you have aviation at the end. Talk about those three lines of business in their futures. Well, the healthcare business is in very good shape, and GE intends to retain 19.9% of that business. Um, ultimately, that may be sold. That will end up, if, if it, this process continues to its fruition in, in the aviation business, that's stake. But the that that's 2023. So here we are, we're in 2021. That's a bit of a waiting time, and that means the stock may be volatile or it could be down. Who knows? Um, investors hate waiting, but it takes some time to do these tax-free spinoffs. And also, GE is determined, and this was part of the announcement, to set these three areas off on their own at uh, much lower levels of financial leverage. And that's really where the cash flow is so important. How much can the company generate? To, be, to get um, investment-grade credit ratings for all three is going to be a real that's the serious effort ahead. So that's why they need time. There's 2023 and then 2024 for power and renewables. Yep. So we um we await all that information, but but there's really positive signaling happening here. Otherwise, why would announce why would they announce it now? They would just continue to work on it and not let us know. Yeah, Larry kept emphasizing three publicly traded investment grade companies. He's very proud of that, that they'll be all be investment grade from his point of view at least. Talk about power, which has also struggled, had a lot of problems, some residual problems with some maintenance contracts and things. Uh, what about keeping traditional power together with renewables? Siemens went a different way. They let renewables Renewables go off on its own, maybe a bigger growth thing. Do you think that makes sense? As an investor, do you look at that and say, yeah, that's sensible? It is, given the mix that GE has. Renewables ultimately, as we all assume, will be the business that sustains in the future. But it was never really our preferred of their businesses, and we're glad to see it be set aside and spun off. The Again, the aviation and the healthcare business is far superior in terms of free cash flow generation. Uh, aviation almost and generated almost none in the downturn and now is coming back. We think there's a normalized $4 billion of free cash just from that business. And if you wrap the whole, all of it up together and you think about it today, there might be normalized seven to $8 billion of free cash flow coming from the, the sum of the three parts. That's something that no, I don't think GE has delivered for a very, very long time. And Sarah, I'll come back to you as an investor, because as I say, Larry kept emphasizing that allows an investor to decide which, if any, of these lines they want to play in. Is it more valuable to be able to pick and choose among health and power and aviation than to have it all lumped together and have to buy the whole package? Very definitely. We as investors prefer that. And then we think about them, you want the uh, senior managements of each, and they're not, uh, Larry's according to our industrial analysts, is the best industrial CEO in the country. So there's a lot right there. Him running aviation without any distractions, fantastic. And then there are two very skilled individuals who will be the CEOs of the power and of the healthcare business. But think about it. They and their, and their team can be compensated on their own efforts without the um, distractions and or dilution of any other parts of the business. They can really focus. They'll have each have their own individual boards of directors who can focus on that business. So yes, this is, given there weren't synergies, this makes perfect sense. And we expect the 
stock price to ultimately reflect this and be a very significant return for our clients. Very quickly at the end, Sarah, is this the end of conglomerates? Mm, you know, I, I, <laughs> hard to say. I, mean, I think they'll continue. There are plenty of them in Japan, for example. Uh, in, unless they're desperate, like Toshiba, they don't, they don't break up. But, but we're not patient as investors, and this is true globally. And when we see a company who's, who, yeah. for example, if it's multiple right. being suppressed, we want them to fix it. Yeah, and by the way, Toshiba had a little nudge, as I recall, from some activists. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. It's always great having you with us. That's Sarah Ketterer. She's CEO of Causeway Capital Management. Coming up, we take a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It is time now to take a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. And we start with Juliet Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. Events in Singapore take center stage this week with the fourth annual Bloomberg New Economy Forum here in the Lion City. We'll ask world leaders and key executives about the growing divide between Beijing and Washington. China in focus on the economic front with monthly activity data due Monday. Japan will also post third quarter GDP numbers after producer prices jumped to their highest in 40 years. Turning to equities, Alibaba and JD.com earnings will give us another pulse check on China's tech sector. Plus, India opens its borders to foreigners for the first time since the pandemic began. Now over to Danny Berger in London. Danny. Thanks, Juliet. Well, on Tuesday, we get UK jobs numbers coming out, followed by the next day, uh, CPI for the region as well. It'll be crucial for the BOE uh, to really ascertain whether or not they will indeed raise rates after they did in their last meeting to the surprise of many. In the week, we also have an ECB financial stability review, which they're set to publish. How much will sky high asset prices feature in that review? To round out the week later, uh, we also are going to be getting a Turkish central bank decision. All economists surveyed by Bloomberg expect that they will continue to ease monetary policy, something which Erdogan has called for. This, of course, all despite the fact that we've seen inflation readings as high as 20 percent and the lira continuing to tumble. Now over to Romain Bostic in New York. Thanks, Danny. Retail sales data and department store earnings are going to be in focus a new round of insight into consumer spending. Economists project U.S. retail sales growth likely re-accelerated in October from September as consumer demand for a variety of goods remain resilient. That's the good part. The concern, that that resiliency in consumption is putting even greater strain on global supply chains. Insight into how retailers are navigating those supply chain distortions, that will come in the latest earnings reports next week from Walmart, Home Depot, Target, TJX, Macy's, and Kohl's. Expect analysts to pepper executives on the conference call with a lot of questions about inventory, shipping times, labor costs, and pricing power. And it's that pricing power and how it's passed on to consumers that ties directly into the most recent CPI numbers, which are now running at a faster pace than wage growth. We'll get a chance to hear from multiple Fed members about how monetary policy will address those recent price spikes. The presidents of the regional Fed banks in Cleveland, San Francisco, Chicago, and Atlanta are each scheduled to speak publicly in the week ahead. David? Thanks to Julia, Danny, and Romaine. Coming up, it was nice while it lasted, but is the longest bull market in history about to come to an ugly end? We talk with famed investor Jeremy Grantham of GMO. When the decline comes, it will be uh, perhaps bigger and better than anything previously in U.S. history. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Asset bubbles, they're the one thing every investor wants to avoid. From the tulip frenzy of 17th century Netherlands to Wall Street in 1929, 
to the tech bubble of 2000. The problem is knowing when you're in a bubble and when it will end. Fed Chair Jay Powell has recognized since last spring that asset values are stretched. If you look at asset valuations, um, you can say that by some measures, some asset valuations are elevated compared to history. I think that's clear. While others, like Kathy Wood of ARC, say we're just getting started, that in fact the market has been broadening and getting healthier. There has been a rotation into value as a style, as fears of inflation and interest rates increasing picked up, and therefore there's been a broadening out of this, the, this bull market. Right. I think we are in a very strong bull market. And then you have Tesla, which some people say is a bubble in and of itself, skyrocketing to a market cap of over a trillion dollars, or roughly 20 times what it was just four years ago. While others see Tesla not as a bubble, but as the exception that proves the rule, changing the entire face of the automobile industry. That's the view of star quarterback Tom Brady, as he talked about Hertz's decision to include Teslas in its fleet. I've had a Tesla for about four years, and um, again, I think it's uh, it's kind of the direction the world is heading, and I think for me it was about being really conscious about the impact that we all have on, on our planet. Whether it is Tesla or tech or markets overall, no one has been more outspoken about the possibility of bubbles than Jeremy Grantham. He is co-founder of GMO and really a student through the history of markets that are overheated. And we welcome him now to Wall Street Week. Mr. Grantham, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, let's talk about bubbles, but let's come in if we can through Tesla, because you've talked some about Tesla in the past. I mean, last time I checked, I think the market cap is something like 40 times what it was four years ago. Uh, is Tesla a bubble? Yes. That's pretty easy. I, and having said that, I'm the proud owner of a Model 3, and I, I do think they're magnificent vehicles, and I think Tesla has done extraordinarily well. But if you go back into the life cycle of the fangs, uh, Tesla is many multiples of the price-to-sales ratio that they were at this stage in their lives. And they have been brilliantly successful. So Tesla is A, assuming it will be brilliantly successful, and B, assuming it will be, in addition to that, multiples as successful as the other fangs. And they are some of the great companies in the history of capitalism. So, so this is a, a big ask. Yeah, I'm always reluctant to say it might be different this time, but let me ask that question. Could it be different this time when it comes to Tesla? Because it is at the crosshairs of a fundamental technological transformation to electric vehicles and a real fight for the climate globally, a part, an important part of that. So is it possible that is different? There's a major transformation going on here that's bigger than what we've seen before. I think if you were defending the fangs, you would say in each case that they represented, like Amazon, a, a, a crucial fork in the road on retailing. If you were looking at Facebook and, and uh, Netflix, all, all of them represent these breakout major changes, disruptive changes. And uh, I'm very grateful for Tesla as a dedicated green that they have pioneered uh, EVs. But now in phase two, every, every great automobile company all the Mercedes and, and the BMWs and so on, and, and the VWs are all gearing up uh, to go electric. And, we, and that, that owes a lot to Tesla. But now in phase two, they're gonna have to have some serious competition and, and to live up to the expectations of the price uh, will be impossible. It's interesting you mentioned the other auto companies because in looking at Tesla, I wonder how much of the valuation that's being put in the stock right now is really dependent upon it being almost by itself. That is to say, a very large moat around the company and how defensible that. And also the question is, what about disruption of Tesla? I think you're involved actually in a company, Quantum Scope, that in success on the battery side could actually disrupt Tesla itself. Absolutely. The new technologies come along all the time, particularly in uh, solid state lithium. And um, many, many things can go wrong with Tesla. I think they're a very fast moving company and they'll handle that kind of problem. And they'll be worth a lot of money. The question only is, has, has it discounted uh, 50 years into the future rather than five or 10? And I think it probably has. 
So, so speaking more broadly, you've said that we're in something, I think you called it an epic bubble right now. Uh, I think you've been very careful to say, I'm not going to predict when it ends. I'm just going to say that it does end. What's going to bring it to an end? The thing about the Great Bubbles 1929, Japan, no, no one knows after all these years exactly why the bubble peaked. You can say with hindsight it peaked at the point, of course, of maximum euphoria. So there was no hint of, of darkness at the end of the tunnel. Uh, everything looked absolutely splendid as the market peaked. And of course, as long as it looks absolutely splendid, everybody is happy. The, the thing about the great bubbles is how intensely do people buy into the idea that it can never break, that prices will never decline. The housing bubble of 2005, 2006 in America was a, a brilliant bubble in that description. You had people going out and buying a second house to rent because house prices never declined. Indeed, Ben Bernanke said US house prices have never declined. Of course, then they promptly did but that is par for the course for the Federal Reserve. In 1929, there was a, a terrific buy-in and you could read articles in the Ladies' Home Journal saying all you had to do to get rich was to buy stocks and hold on to them. And the same thing occurred in, in 2000 in the tech bubble. And the same thing occurred in the biggest bubble of all, which was Japan in 1989, when the Japanese market went to 65 times earnings. But in US history, I would say there's a bigger buy-in this time to the idea that prices never decline and that all you have to do is buy them um, than there has ever been, which suggests that when the decline comes, it will be uh, perhaps bigger and better than anything previously in U.S. history. You've talked about the tech bubble in 2000 that you famously really did anticipate, but you paid a price for getting out of the market at that place because other people continued to make money. People who were, were a value investor switched over. You stuck with it. At the same time, the longer that bubble goes, the bigger it gets. Does that represent the possibility to, for you to make more money when it does burst? If, if you can handle going short, getting out of the way, uh, yes, you can make a lot of money. This bubble, in part, if it is in bubble, as you describe it, uh, must in part be because of the amazing liquidity pumped into the, the world market, frankly, but certainly the Fed participated in that fully. We now, just the week, this week, have some uh, pretty staggering numbers on consumer prices, up over 6% annualized right now in the United States. To what extent will the pricking of this bubble come if the Fed needs to respond and really step on the, on the break and maybe do it even a little abrupt, abruptly? Markets peak when inflation is low and profit margins are high. It, it's not about growth. They like GDP to be very stable. They hate it bouncing around. It makes portfolio managers nervous. And our model that goes back to 1925 explains almost all the ebbing and flowing of market, bull markets and bear markets. And uh, until, until June of last year, uh, starting in June of last year, uh, is the first time that inflation, the number one predictor since 1925, is ignored. It, if you want to explain today's market level, yes, you have handsome profit margins. Every bull market it has a wonderful economy. Every bull market has a plentiful supply of liquidity. But every bull market before this one had low inflation. In order to explain today's market, you have to assume 100% ignoring of the rising inflation, which is quite remarkable. Yeah, We've I... never seen anything like this. We've just hit 6% today. That would have been enough in any market since 1925. And for all I know, long before that, it would have been enough to have crashed the market. But this time, the faith in the Fed is so complete that when they say it's temporary, we believe it. The Fed, in my opinion, hasn't done a thing right since Paul Volcker, who was brilliant. All of the others have encouraged a, a chain series of really dangerous uh, asset bubbles. They, they rattle the economy. They're incredibly disruptive. The decline in 2000, 82% in the NASDAQ, was a decline from 2000. The decline of the housing market all the way back to trend and below, dragging the world with it. 
um, and all of the problems from bad mortgages and, and, and a 50% decline in the S&P. The, these have a terrible wealth effect. They make people feel poor and they make people spend less. It's the last thing you want. And yet they have not learned. They overstimulated to get to 2000. They overstimulated in the housing market. They got three or 4% more people to own houses in 2007 than had ever owned houses before. And the conse consequences were dire. And uh, have they learned? Absolutely not. So in this time, they step into uh, COVID. And of course, you needed to stimulate. But did you need to throw this much money all over the world so that it flows into the stock market and creates, creates these meme stocks, this craziness that had Avis triple in one day <laughs> in, the, in the last week? And uh, why did it triple? Because in response to Tesla and Hertz and Tom Brady, et cetera, uh, Avis said, hey, dudes, we're going to buy some electric cars, too. <laughs> Wham, it triples. You know, this is more extreme in scale and size um, of, of uh, market cap than anything that occurred in 1929, mm. even adjusted for the size of the economy. Thank you so much. That's Jeremy Grantham. He is co-founder of GMO. Coming up, we wrap up the week, as always, with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and we're joined once again by our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, you had quite a week, if I can put it that way, because you've been warning on this program and otherwise uh, again and again, week after week, about inflation. And boy, this week we got it. 6.2 percent on the headline number on CPI, shocking an awful lot of people. I guess I start out with, why did you get it right? And so many economists, including the Federal Reserve and, for that matter, the White House, why did they get it wrong? David, you know, I did it seemed to me, apply a fairly basic economic model to the magnitude of the demand stimulus. And it seemed to me it predicted that we'd get uh, certainly a significant rise uh, in inflation. And then there were some other things that came along on the supply side that I didn't foresee, that others didn't foresee, that made it even worse uh, than I had expected. I think there are a couple lessons uh, from this uh, episode. One is that it's always important to avoid excessive certainty. The policymakers in economics who go, work, go wrong the most are the ones who are most confident of a single model. You've always got to recognize that there are a wide range of uh, possibilities. You know, on your show, I always said that I thought this was the risk and the most likely thing, but there was a one in three chance that this would all work out terrifically and uh, that I'd be entirely wrong. I think more recognition of all the range of possibilities is a good discipline for policymakers and economists. I also think that we have a problem, and it's a pretty broad problem, with uh, what I call motivated belief. People really wanted to engage for all sorts of reasons, humanitarian, uh, political, related to momentum at the beginning of an administration in a very, very large stimulus program. And so they convinced themselves that it wouldn't be uh, inflationary because they really wanted it to uh, not be inflationary. Yeah, we have a problem with inflation. I think everyone at this point agrees with you we have a problem. But the question is how big a problem and for how long? Because we had Paul Krugman, you've identified him earlier as a friend of yours and a former classmate, I believe, Hillary. And he came out this week in the New York Times and said, you know, this is not like the 1970s. It's like 1946 to 1948 when people came back from the war. There was a big uptick in demand. Supply had to catch up. And the worst thing we could do would be to tighten because back then they did tighten and it led to a recession. What do you say to that? analysis you know, Paul's examples have been have sort of been bouncing around a bit I, I think the most obvious example continues to be uh, the Vietnam War the 
Other obvious example is the 1970s, where people were saying temporary due to specific factors all the time. I guess I don't really uh, hear uh, the music on uh, Paul's uh, thing. Uh, my own sense continues to be that if you look at ongoing developments in the labor market, if you look at what is feeding through in housing, if you look at the evidence on the range of commodities being caught up in inflation rising, if you look at uh, the available data on uh, expectations, then uh, I think it is hard to uh, not have considerable concern that an inflation is entrenching that is not going to go away without some significant new other uh, development. I've not said, I've been very careful all along to say what I believe, uh, David, which is that, yes, there is transitory inflation, but to say that there is some inflation that is transitory is not to say that we're still a, going to be a 2% inflation country. I like to look at the month-to-month -month figures better than the one-year figures. And as you know, the month-to-month -month figure for the CPI last month was above 11%. I've got no doubt that that contains a substantial amount, a very substantial amount of transitory uh, inflation. But that doesn't mean we're back to uh, target uh, inflation. How can it be that when you have an interest rate that's running at negative 2 or 3%, you have the biggest labor shortages at highest vacancy rate since they collected statistics, that that's an environment for uh, natural uh, deflation. I don't, I just don't hear uh, that uh, argument, which is why it seems to me we need to be recognizing what the American people very broadly are uh, recognizing but we still quite have, haven't quite heard the Fed say, which is <laughs> the major economic concern of the United States today is overheating. Larry, from monetary policy to restructuring corporations, we've had a spate this week of large corporations breaking themselves up. First, General Electric going into three parts. Then at the end of the week, we have Johnson & Johnson breaking into two parts. And over uh, in Asia, we have Toshiba breaking into a couple of major component parts as well. Is there something more fundamental underlying this? What is driving this increasing emphasis on focus rather than synergy? David, I, I think this is a broadly positive thing. I think in most cases, these splits probably have come later than uh, would have been ideal. And I think those who don't like markets and don't like activists should be given a little pause by this kind of uh, development. I think it's two things. Uh, the first is that in an increasingly complicated world, it's the essence of strategy to compensate, uh, to build on strength rather than to compensate for weakness. And all of us are better off specializing a bit on what our distinctive talent is or what it is that is our strength. And I think that's true for companies as well. Second, investors, through their investments, express beliefs. Some people believe in prescription drugs and biotech. Others believe that consumer products are going to be uh, the best way forward. Some people believe that the aviation business is good. Other people believe the healthcare business is going to be good. Not many people believe in particular sandwiches that were put together decades ago. And so by splitting companies up, people give investors an opportunity to express the kinds of beliefs that investors are likely to have rather than to bet on somewhat oddly and historically constructed sandwiches. That's what I think this is about, and I think for the most part it's a good thing.
Thank you so very much. That's our special Wall Street Week contributor. It's Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, one more thought. Are conglomerates going the way of the dodo bird? This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. The last of the conglomerates. There was a time not so terribly long ago when conglomerates were all the rage. Think Harold Janine of ITT, Gulf and Western, Linton Industries, many of which grew up and then died away. But then there was GE, the biggest of them all. It lasted the longest. When we had Jack Welch take what was a light bulb company founded by Thomas Elva Edison in the 19th century and expand it, expand it to television and motion pictures and most of all into finance. He took a company that had revenues about $26 billion a year to $130 billion a year. The market cap went up over $450 billion. It was the largest in the world at the time. But trees don't grow to the sky and neither did GE. Jack Welch moved on, we had Jeff Immelt take his place, and during his tenure, we took what had been the gold standard for corporate America and turned it into something of a turnaround. And in the end, even Jeff Immelt couldn't quite explain why that had happened. We had, uh, through multiple recessions, we had uh, really generated record earnings and cash flow. We had good businesses, good people, good initiatives, but at the end of the day, the stock price lagged. So three and a half years ago, the GE board turned to Larry Culp, the former CEO of Danaher, to sort things out. Larry came in and pretty much threw out the playbook of Jack Welch. He pruned, he focused on cash flow and debt reduction, and he just plain focused overall. It all came to a head this week when Larry Culp announced that he would break up the company into three parts, healthcare, power, and aviation. These businesses will be more focused. There'll be a higher, greater level of accountability. We should have sharper capital allocation, more strategic flexibility. And frankly, I think it's going to be good for the team as well. So is this the end of conglomerates? Nicholas Heyman of William Blair echoed Larry Culp, who said it really is more important to focus today rather than go for those synergies across different businesses. It's much more important to have uh, really 110% uh, focus on one end market and set of customers because things are changing so structurally and so rapidly that um, you really can't be burdened by having to wait for another part of the company to come around. While Jerry Davis of Michigan Ross School thinks that there may still be room for conglomerates when it comes to tech. Anybody think of Amazon? There is a future for conglomerates, but it's in the IT sector. If you look at big tech companies like Alphabet, uh, like Facebook, they really are conglomerates. In some sense, they are hearkening back to the conglomerate that GE was at its birth. But if you listen to Larry Culp himself, it's not about the form. It's not whether it's a conglomerate or not a conglomerate. In the end, it's about getting the job done. It's ultimately about performance, right? I've, I've been in companies where we did a number of things under one roof. So I, I've seen it from a number of different angles. But ultimately, it's all about looking forward and being in a position to perform. And I think for GE today, on three separate bottoms, we'll be at our best. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.